Uh, well, good evening. Thank you, Alan. That was, uh, I think you've done most of my lecture. I'm happy with that. Very excited. Definitely uh, just like to say a few thanks before I start, because the thanks always come at the end. So thank you to the University of Melbourne for inviting NH to participate in this program. We're very privileged to be here. Uh, thank you to my colleagues at the NH studio, some of you who are tonight, uh, particularly Nick Bonds and Astrid Jenkins, two people who are really seminal to the ongoing future of NH. And I'd also like to say I've been invited because I was an alumni of the University of Melbourne, uh, and without getting shabby, I did attend a few beers up at a North Fitzroy pub a few weeks ago, uh, and it was the it was someone's birthday, but in fact it was most of the people that were in the 1982 architecture stage review here at Melbourne Uni. So we were the performers in an auditorium that was not as glamorous as this, but it was a good, good time to get together and see people. So thank you. Uh, tonight I'm going to talk about public architecture, as Alan said. Um, there's probably more questions than answers tonight. Um, I'm going to be a bit bit discursive over here because I can see one of the people looking after my PhD over in the corner there. I'm in deferment at the moment, but there are a lot of questions. Uh, and really, it is a conversation about questions rather than answers. So tonight, we're talking about questions. So the exhibition upstairs is about public architecture. Uh, and the conversation is there is no public architecture. And I think, you know, you, you'll see that the gold is the... Um, the common theme for the evening, um, and we'll talk about that at the very, very end. Um, but we, we have, there is no public architecture, or there is only public architecture. So we decided to put there is no public architecture in bold, bold gold, and face it out to the foyer of the MSD upstairs. Partly to make people get a little bit angry, a little bit annoyed, going, I want to come down and see what's going on. Um, because that's a fairly pessimistic conversation, that there is no public architecture. But on the other side, it does say, if you do go to the exhibition and turn around, it says there's only public architecture. Uh, and we thought the silver was a good way to deal with that. So it was really a conversation to say, what are the two diametrically opposed things that... It's a question on both sides. There is no answer. And we'll talk about that in the next 40 minutes. There is only public architecture. There is no public architecture. So I'll start also by saying that this is referred to as a keynote lecture. Uh, I'll admit I'm a practicing architect, so I'm not a lecturer, because I always think of lectures when I was at uni here as things with um, what was the date of the Pugin Parliament House and this and that. It was like facts. I'm not going to talk about facts tonight. I'm going to talk about slightly more broad, speculative conversations. So I don't think this is so much a lecture. I think it's more like a talk. So I'll start by saying, yes, I'm a designer, and the designer is a fat moron with a giant head. <laughs> this is a David Shrigley, English artist's image, uh, which is both humorous and serious at the same time. I am a designer. I might be a moron. I, might have, I do have a giant head, but I'm not that fat, so I don't quite get that right. Uh, but it's the cliché, and it's important to think about this. You know, we're in a school of architecture, and most of you, I'm assuming, are architects or interested in architecture. But in the end, if you ask people on the street, that's probably what they think an architect is, a fat moron with a big head drawing pictures. Uh, at the opening of the exhibition, there was someone whose uh, partner is a very, very important emergency doctor at the Royal Melbourne Hospital, and he was surprised at how eloquent and clever we were. He just thought architects drew pictures. And that was an interesting reflection, that in the end, there is still this idea that architects do this sort of stuff. Well, we do a lot more, and really, if you're engaging in public architecture, you do have to do a lot more. So what is public architecture? That is a very, very difficult question to answer, and almost like impossible to answer. So I'll start by saying it is impossible to answer this. You can only cogitate, speculate, discuss, and review this conversation. There is no answer. Again, if we go back to what is the conventional idea of public architecture, you go out on the street and you ask the, um, you ask the Scott Morrison voters and the Herald Sun voters, uh, what is public architecture? This is the sort of picture that, that would be in their mind. It's a sort of building with columns and a pedimenty thing, and it's classical, and you know, it's, it's a sort of nice classical building. That's what a lot of people would assume is public architecture. Parliament is parliament, courthouse is courthouse, Police station is police station. What's the problem? It's public architecture. So that's the case. 
In fact, in this case, it's an interesting, I use this one deliberately because I do enjoy this project, been there a few times, on the World Heritage Register. Um, it's Ledoux's Royal Salt Works, very fine building. Um, but in fact, what you see uh, was blown up with dynamite. Well, first of all, the chapel was destroyed in 1918 by lightning, so obviously God wasn't on their side. Uh, and then the insurance people decided it was no longer making enough money as the salt works. So they dynamited the building to get the insurance money. Thankfully, the French government decided that was not acceptable, so it was rebuilt. But it's an example that you think public architecture is in perpetuity. But no, this was basically an insurance fraud. Dynamite, bang, gone. And in fact, they unfortunately chopped down all the trees, and there's only th three that survive. So that's it's an initial discussion about the confluence between architecture as a language, a physical form. But yeah, this was an advanced 1926 insurance scam to get the money. And then the other sort of, you know, again, a favourite building of mine, if you ask someone in the public on the street, I could have picked Parliament House at the top of Burke Street, What's, what is public architecture? They go, well, it's the sort of thing with columns and stuff. You know, that's, that is public architecture, um, which is partly true. And this is a beautiful building by Carl Frederick Schinkel uh, in 1825, the transition between what you would call conventional classicism and modernism. So this was a transitional building, colonnade sublime. So I'm not saying this isn't important. This is a kind of public architecture, but it's not the only kind of public architecture. And in contemporary worlds, this is totally lovely to visit and really sublimely spectacular, but it has to be seen in the category of its time and place. And then if we go local, this is a uh, Wolfgang Sievers, a famous photographer from the 1960s and 70s of the NGV, which is topical today because they did announce the winner of the NGV C competition. So for the worst kept secret in Melbourne, if you didn't know it, you can see it today. Um, but this was in Melbourne in the 19, late 1960s, uh, early 1970s. It was really our biggest attempt to create what we would call conventional public architecture. And it is still a truly sublime building and we did have an interview uh, with some very emeritus people recently uh, and this was the number one project that came up on the list for people, Melbournean architects going, this is our favourite building, including myself. So um, I'm not trying to put it down, this is a truly beautiful building. It was probably more beautiful before the renovation that was done in 2004 but still a very beautiful building. So the question is, how do you measure publicness. How do you measure public architecture? What is the measure of that? Now this is where the questions and the answers get even more complex. Um, but an interesting one is, uh, this is probably familiar to many people who live certainly in Australia and in Victoria. When you go through most country towns, you go down to the beach, whatever it is, you'll see this before you enter the town. Uh, and it's, a, it's for us as Australians and Victorians a reasonably familiar Thing. And I'll admit, for me, it's been part of my childhood and my adulthood for all my life. So it's for me, I go, yeah, yeah. And you look at where the arrow is and so forth. But last year, or the year, COVID, post, 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 post COVID, the year before, uh, when we had visiting architects that we're working with from 3XN in Copenhagen uh, and working with the team from Snowheader from Oslo, they were out here fairly regularly and they would do on the weekends, they would do tours of Victoria which they totally enjoyed, but they found this hilarious. And I was, why, why is it hilarious? Because the metric of how you rate, prepare, act, survive, they thought, well, that's pretty extreme. Like, you know, survive is extreme. But the thing they liked the most, or they liked, they commented on the most, was there were six categories. And it started with low, moderate, and then went, high, ding. And so the other five, high, very high, extreme, severe, extreme, death, you know, catastrophic, they were like a bit surprised that you only had one category for low moderate and you had five that were basically about death. And for us, that was sort of, you know, not a good thing, but for us, that's a kind of, you get used to this symbol. You go, well, that's kind of, and most of the times you go by, and it's almost never on the low moderate. It's sometimes in the high, very high, not good in the catastrophic, but it's a metric that we get used to in our, climate, our language, our environments, our experience. That's how we measure, in this case, a 
a certain level of publicness because it is a public indicator of risk in bushfire. But for people from Scandinavia, they just thought it was totally bizarre that you had one category in green and the rest was like, holy shit, holy shit, we're going to die. Fortunately, when they were travelling around Victoria, we were in a good state. So, But they did find that very, very parochial. And that's when I realised how you measure is based a little bit upon the cultural lens in which you operate. And the other thing that's occurred is in the old days, public buildings, and again, conventional wisdom would say public buildings are paid for by some government, someone over there, like someone will pay for it. It'll come out of treasury and finance. It'll just be paid for. But certainly in my practising experience in the last 20 years, all the public buildings I've worked on have not been paid for. Well, I shouldn't say that. Not many have been paid for by what you would call the traditional public purse. They've been in this slightly complex public-private relationship or private-public, where it's a combination of private sector resources and public need. And that has produced an interesting sort of... I've referred to this before as being the Faustian deal as architects. We get caught in a trap of going, I want to design a public building. I should say, if anyone here is interested in designing you know, boutique beach houses or wineries, this is not the talk for you. This is about public architecture. This is about how you actually make public things. So the Faustian deal is, I want to make a public building. And in Australia and in Victoria, hospital, school, train station, road, anything in that space that you want to be involved in, you have to learn this deal, how you manage the deal between government funding and private sector funding. So if you want to do a school and actually engage in schools, you have to learn this process. So it's, it is a deal. We do need to learn that process. Uh, and this is the point of origin. Um, incredibly boring, but incredibly important. So you get sent these documents, which are expressions of interest, request, requests for tender. So you have to go through a very, very lengthy, it's a bit like going back to your VCE exams. You have to go through somewhere between three and six months worth of exams to be selected to do this work. So there's again a slight cliche fallacy that someone's gonna just rock up from the government and go, can you please design me a school or a train station? The answer is no. You have to go through a very, very extensive, it's a bit like qualifying for the Olympics and then getting in the trials and da -da -da, and da -da. it takes a long time. So for practicing architects, we are aware that this is a very extensive process. Uh, and there's also a certain nomenclature in what we do. Uh, you, you know, I've just used the word EOI, RFT. Uh, every department we work for has different terms. Uh, I certainly work in a whole range of government departments. Uh, I know my colleagues Astrid and Nick work in departments where they can be three quarters of the way down a conversation and I'm going, I've got no idea what you're talking about. Uh, so this was a, uh, it's now a nice formal note, but this was a handwritten note that my project architect gave me a few years ago. And even this is funny because this is a few years ago and most of these government departments have changed their names. So that shows how quickly the coding and the nomenclature changes. But this was a note that was left on my desk in handwriting to tell me that I had to go to a Gateway 3 meeting for the Department of the Design Quality Team for the Office of the Victorian Government, the Melbourne City Council, the Department of Economic Land, Water and Planning, including Sport and Rec Victoria, Tennis Australia, Major Projects Victoria, Melbourne Olympic Park Trust for the Stage 3 Master Plan, so the Department of Treasury and Finance can endorse the Master Plan for the business case. <laughs> now, that is funny, but it's true. So I am giving you the truth. That was what was on my desk. The funny part is, or the sad part is, I understood it. So I could do that with work we do in the health section. I could do it with work we do in... But that's the... and that I'm not sure it's a good thing, but in public architecture, the coding of language has re been reduced to this kind of snappy algorithm. And you, if you want to participate in it, you do have to learn that stuff. And I know some of the NH team who are here tonight are pretty schmick at that now. Um, now, the other thing, a uh, way of describing it is in public architecture, in the public-private sector, there is this interesting combination about risk. Who's carrying the risk? Unfortunately, if most of you, I'm assuming, are architects, we're the poor buggers that usually get the, get the poor end of the stick. Um, but in my PhD program, I've used this as the analogy that risk is a bit like, this is the obviously famous London underground, 
risk is a bit like the train system in the English underground system. It moves around all the time. It never leaves the system, but everyone else is pushing it onto the next station. The bank is pushing it onto the financier. The financier is putting it onto the builder. The builder is putting it onto the government. The government's putting it onto the... And unfortunately, we tend to live at the end of the line. So in the end, the architect inherits it. But it moves around all the time. The risk and the publicness never disappear. It just stays within the system. And it's really a question of... And I won't get into contracts and professional practice. That's one of my other lectures, so I'll leave that one on the side. But just think about it as being the case the publicness is part of this process of understanding where it actually sits in the system. So I go back to the beginning. Um, this is really where I started my interest in the 1990s. Uh, these were two projects I worked on reasonably sequentially. Uh, on the left, you've got Crown Casino. On the right, you've got the largest public courthouse built in Victoria since the 1888 Supreme Court, the County Court of Victoria. Uh, and you would always think on the left, the casino is the most private commercial building you could ever imagine. On, getting myself right, on the right, the courthouse, the most public building you can imagine. But in the end, that's a pretty, again, blunt and cliché view. Uh, the Crown Casino project is privately owned, but it is the most visited building in Victoria. So you're going, if you measure, again, if you go back to the fire indices, how do you measure publicness? This is the most visited building by the public in Victoria. So at one level you go, well, that's a measure to go, well, it's kind of pretty public. It might be privately owned, but it is the most visited in, in Victoria. Um, I think the penguins are number three. Uh, and this is the County Court of Victoria, and everyone goes, oh, it's courthouse, it's public, it's public. Uh, and as a young architect, I was involved in the design of this, but when we finished it facetiously, we did look into the Institute of Architects awards program and realised that nine out of the ten categories, it could actually go in the commercial category, because it is a public-private partnership program. It's privately owned, privately operated. The lifts are privately maintained. The windows are privately cleaned. The government, in this case the government of Victoria, rents it for court purposes. It's a commercial building that is rented for justice. So it is actually for the next, well, for 35 years, and we're now, must be getting old, we're about 15 years down the line. Um, it is a commercial building that the government simply rent for court purposes. So it's not a public building, it's a commercial building rented for courts. So as architects, that poses a slightly ideological problem. How do you design functionally? Not so hard, because the functional brief is very clear. But language, what is the architecture of a contemporary public building that in fact the public don't sponsor? It's not actually owned by government, it's actually owned by a private equity financier. So what? Do we put columns and pediments? What is the... So that is a challenging question for public architecture and is still a challenge. Uh, and another one that is interesting, I think, is this one was on Instagram a couple of weeks ago. This is the Sydney Opera House. Everyone knows it's famous for the beautiful... It's a beautiful building. I'm not going to diminish it. It is world, it is world class. It is unbelievably spectacular. Um, but they put this image on Instagram to talk about the beauty of the monumental steps. Uh, and there's no question, they are, uh, I think the, 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 the whole thing is beautiful. The podium often gets a bit overlooked, but it is, it is the great piece of architecture. The podium and the steps are truly beautiful. Uh, and this was an image lauding the fact that these were the greatest monumental steps in Australia. And I went, yeah, totally agree. But now, they're illegal. If we did this now, we couldn't do it. We would have handrails at two-metre centres. We'd have tactile, uh, tactile things at each landing. We'd have visual requirements for tread to stair ratios. We'd have, again, not saying a bad thing, but it's interesting that these tropes get put out as being, these are great pieces of architecture. A bit like if we go back to the Ledoux salt works. They are. But in contemporary public architecture, there's a certain level of, as a practising architect, a certain level of frustration. You go, yeah, I'd love to do this but I can't. I've got 40,000 consultants telling me I can't do that. And that's good as well. But it's interesting, that debate about what you can and can't do in contemporary public buildings. So what is the definition of public? Tricky one. Now, one of the quotes that's in the exhibition upstairs is, and it came from a year six student at RMIT, 
uh, and one that's had a few people perplexed, we make volume to house program. And I'm going like, well, when you really cook it down to its most fundamental DNA, that's a pretty good way of doing it. We do create volume to house program. We have ideology, we have polemic, we have theory, we have context, we have a whole lot of things that are really important. But if I had to pick the one that my experience is, that's kind of probably a bit crass to say, that's kind of what we're paid to do. We make volume to house program. So what does that mean? Well, I'll use a project that we did 10 years ago, which is, uh, you can see here is the Margaret Court Arena next to Rod Laver Arena, um, recently um, made, you know, well, it's under the Djokovic saga of vaccination, so it's become topical for other reasons. Um, but it's a project that we were engaged originally, uh, the Margaret Court Arena, that I hope will soon be the Yvonne Goulagong Court Arena or the Ash Party Arena, um, to make a building that houses the tennis for the Australian Open. Uh, so it was really, can you please make us a world-class, grand slam, internationally significant building and court for, and it's interesting because it's the Margaret Court Court, because Margaret Court is her name. There's always a joke that it's actually Margaret Court Court, but no one ever quite got that. Uh, so we designed a building that was really, at the start of the design, aimed at housing international grand slam tennis tournaments. So these are some of my original sketches, and I, I used these ones because I thought it was an interesting conversation that I overheard years before when the Colonial, Etihad, Colonial Stadium, Etihad Stadium, something stadium, now Marvels, whatever that stadium in Docklands is now called, it's had many, many names, that stadium was being designed, uh, and it was designed by a collaborative team. One of the members was Daryl Jackson, and one of the advisory people was Ian McDougall. Uh, and so they had a conversation about how you design a stadium. And Daryl Jackson was using the words that it needs to, sport is all about symmetry, balance, perfection. You know, it was all this beauty about it has to be symmetrical, balanced. And Ian McDougall's on the other side of the table. And I was a young architect going, that's bullshit. Sport's not about balance, it's about winning. One person wins, another person loses. It's about getting beaten up in the football which I appreciate because he's a St Kilda supporter. So there was two views on what sport was. Daryl was saying it's about symmetry, beauty, balance, organisation, and Ian's going, no, no, it's about chaos, madness, someone's going to win, competitive. And I thought that, for me as a young architect, that was interesting for a public building. There was two ways of seeing it. So when we did Margaret Court Arena, we chose to use both. The stadium, the actual court is governed by an obscenely large number of international regulations if you want to have a Grand Slam tournament. It's beyond discussion. It's beyond reproach. You do it. But then the public space around it, the concourses and stuff, it's public space. It's about context. It's about all the things that are occurring in the precinct. So those two ideas could, can, could occur at the same time. So we ended up with a building that sitting in the middle of it is a very, 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 very precise public building and very precise tennis court that Serena Williams and other great players play on. So it is, it is absolutely world class. But in terms of the other stuff, the, the cantilevers, the overhangs, the public space, you know, it's totally free. And in fact, you know, a side note, we had to do the you love government. A minister blurted it out in a meeting going, I want the fastest opening roof in the world. And you go, is that a brief? It was a brief. So this is the fastest opening roof in the world. Now, so if you go to the tennis, they open it in four minutes, but it actually can open in about three and a half minutes, but they get a bit edgy around that. So yeah, the public, the, the, the actual arena is pure symmetrical geometry. It satisfies all the international tennis requirements for a Grand Slam. But if you've been there, the public spaces are really about just connecting with the the precinct, the context. So those two conversations can occur at the same time. And also the idea of being a backdrop. Um, you know, it is on television, so we were conscious of, even if they're not playing in our arena, what does it look like from the other arenas? So there was this idea of, you know, digital space, smart tablets, iPhones, what does it look like from somewhere else? I think it looks pretty good myself. Uh, and they also, the, halfway through the design process, they said, oh, by the way, can we have the, um, the tennis, but can we have the basketball, can we have the netball vixens play, can we have concerts, can we have dinners? And you go, hmm, okay, no problem. 
volume to house program. So this is a building that basically slice and dice can do pretty much everything. I've been to almost all those events. And then when I thought all was done in COVID, it went to another level. Uh, they had the opening night of the ballet at Margaret Court Arena, designed for tennis, but they had the ballet. You go, mm, yeah, I didn't see that one coming. That's a bit of a new one. Um, but for those who went, apparently it was quite good. Uh, there's also the gala dinners. Uh, I've been to a gala dinner um, with Dan Andrews on the table with the Premier, so you can have a dinner with the roof open. Very nice. But they have e-gaming, so you can go and do the ch -ch 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 on whatever they do. I'm not big on the e-gaming, but you can do that there as well. Uh, they have car launches. So as architects, we are designing public buildings that nowadays are being asked to kind of accommodate whatever, you know, literally, can you do this? You go, yeah, sure. But as a design team and a design idea, ideology, it does become complex. Think, <coughs> what is this building going to be used for? And the answer is everything. And the Melbourne Convention Centre is a bit the same. Obviously, it was designed for conventions. Uh, and the plenary hall, I'm sure many of you have been to the plenary hall. Um, it's used for plenaries, schools, you know, it's used for general conversation. Didn't pick boxing. So yes, boxing, uh, they have boxing there. We were told they might have wrestling there, but didn't know they were going to have boxing. So again, it's a throwback to the architects designing public architecture to go, actually, these buildings are operating in quite complex space. And the one that completely threw me over was during COVID, you could drive in to the exhibition hall and watch a drive-in movie in your car in the building, which in this case is obviously Shrek. But I'm a fairly advanced thinker in what you could use a building for, but I wouldn't have picked you could drive in and watch a drive-in movie in the building. Which is actually interesting because we did actually design all the exhaust systems for cars to be in there. So someone must have thought, it's going to be a drive-in movie at some stage. <laughs> Seems as boring as shit to me. Uh, so in order to deal with this public architecture, you do have to understand networks. I'm me, but I work with a huge team of people and a huge group of stakeholders, government departments. It is a massive network. And unless you understand the network, you won't go forward. Uh, this was a quick attempt I did with um, Nick Corrales, who's the CEO of Woodsbagger, to try and explain a network. And we only got halfway and gave up because the network of that information, which appears in a book that Andrew McKenzie's Euro published a few years ago called P Private Life of Public Architecture. Um, but it illustrates the fact that architects are not just these individual handkerchiefs, I think, Alan referred to it, the Frank Lloyd Wright, do the picture on the handkerchief. That's bullshit. You have to understand the network. So proxy public. What's proxy public? Well, there's buildings like Costco, which we designed again 10 years ago, even more. Um, this is the fourth visited, most visited building in Melbourne. So you're going, yeah, it's a, it's a warehouse distribution. You go and buy toilet rolls. You can crap for five years. You go and buy peanut butter that's you know enough for 10 years of but it is the fourth most visited building in Melbourne. And in fact, it was before they started to take the wheel next to it, the eye, what's it called? Whatever it was called, that's how amazingly important it was. Uh, this was more visited than that by about three times. So you're kind of, again, discussing the conversation. This is a distribution warehouse mass building for retail, but it's the fourth most visited, visited building in Melbourne. So it is proxy public. So we had to make proxy public space out the front uh, with a client that wasn't that enthusiastic. But anyhow, we got there. Uh, and another one is Maya, the Maya Department Store Redevelopment. Totally private, private, private commercial arrangement bought by a private equity company from a private. But we inherited the project going, this is totally commercially private. But after 100 years, it's considered by most Melbournians to be a public symbol. Like everyone goes, oh, it's Maya. You know, don't... Someone important in government said to me in private, well, just do something, but don't stuff it up. I'm like, oh, that's, that's a good bit of advice, thank you. <laughs> so there's an inheritance of publicness in a building that has no public qualities. It is entirely privately 
owned, sold, bought, and redeveloped. So how does the architect deal with you know, maintaining the legacy of everyone's fondness of Maya when in fact there's no publicness around it? It is entirely private. On the interiors, it became even more difficult. We created this amazing public room up the top, but by then they decided to move in the iPhone store and a whole lot of crap, which is very disappointing. So what is the new public? Well, I've got an, a few things to throw in there. Uh, the new public is a, a, one of our latest projects, which is the Burwood Brickworks development and Burwood. Um, and why is it the new public? Well, because it is, for me, strangely nostalgically a throwback to medieval villages, Renaissance villages, historical villages. It's not a mixed-use retail store. It's a village. And what do I mean by a village? Well, it's in the middle of Melbourne. It's in Burwood, in the middle suburbs, in the middle ring, in the middle space. By a retail centre and mixed-use centre, it's pretty small. It is literally what you can see. So by, you know, compared to the Chadstons and the Eastlands, this is a little tinky toy thing. Uh, but the reason it's a new public is because it's not a retail centre. It does have a big Woolworths. It does have shops. But it's also got a medical centre. It's got community facilities. It's got a childcare centre. It's got cinemas. It's got a whole range of community activities, which makes it a village in a building. And in fact, if I go back, it's also got an urban farm. And the food that's grown on the roof is used in all the cafes. So this is the first living building challenge mixed use retail centre in the world, which is very important. But all I can say is, again, metrics. You can measure that. So it was incredibly important. Every material, every finish, every bit of the building had to go through forensic and excruciatingly strong detail about how to make it achieve the living building challenge. Incredibly important. Part of me goes, but you can measure that. How do you measure publicness? Well, the publicness is it's actually a village. People come here to go to the cinema. They go to the childcare. They might go to the medical centre. They might not even go to the Woolworths. So it is a community. It's a new form of public architecture. It's a community. There is a slight irony that the door to the childcare and the door to Dan Murphy's are right next to each other, <laughs> which most people go, that's highly appropriate. Let's take that way around. So yes. Uh, and Mandy Nicholson, uh, the Indigenous consultant we had, got involved in what is clearly the major um, emblem of the ceiling, beautiful piece of work. Uh, and so again, it's a com confluence of Woolworths, and I won't name the private equity developer that did it. It's a bit like the ABC, I shouldn't name names. Um, but they were willing to commit to an amazing piece of large Indigenous art in what is, you know, a mixed-use retail centre in Burwood. So there is optimism and hope out there. So what is public? Well, small things. This is our office in Flinders Lane. On the left, you can see the original building by DCM. Possibly not one of their finest pieces of work, but the uh, architect came, uh, the owner came to see us to say, would we like to you know, rejuvenate it? And we said, yes. It sits onto Harry Seidler's number one Spring Street forecourt. So even in these small projects, we look at what is the public dimension. You know, it's a small commercial office building. We're up in the top couple of levels. Um, so we don't, we always look for the public dimension in the work. Even in the very, very small foyer, we decided to make it with a seat. You know, we, we copied, copied? We referred to Harry Seidler's seats across the road in the forecourt and go, let's have one of his seats in our foyer. Global. Yes, we do operate on a global scale. Uh, and going back to Melbourne Park, uh, we've been down there 10 years and we've just completed the high performance centrepiece project, which is a function centre, it's a broadcasting centre, and we find ourselves again at that intersection between what we would like to do as architects uh, mm -hmm. and what, in the international arena of doing these projects, you can negotiate through the number of agencies, government departments, clients, stakeholders, and so forth. So um, for those of you who haven't been, it is now post, post, post COVID, open, um, and we're very proud of the work. 
the building on the other on the tall one is not ours. Just to be clear, that's not ours. <laughs> this is ours. <laughs> Uh, and in the exhibition upstairs, you can see that we've translated that into a plywood model. And the reason we did that was because, again, being didactic, public architecture at some level has become a bit disposable. Um, so we did a reference to the idea, IKEA. I hope there's no lawyers in the room. Um, so in the end, much public architecture sadly can be going down the route of being disposable, an IKEA product. Uh, we live just nearby in Carlton, and every day you come out in the Nature Strip, and there's an IKEA bookshelf almost every day on the Nature Strip. The question is, we need to make sure the public architecture doesn't fall down that rabbit hole. So if you go to the exhibition, you can see a... Uh, and Leona's here. She did translate everything into Swedish, so thank you, Leona. And there's the model. Responsible. Well... We are responsible. We were, in this case, uh, uh, the top there is our new Kia Arena that was played, the tennis was played there this year. Uh, and we were interested from a public point of view to make a public building that was quiet. Rod Laver, our Margaret Court Arena is pretty zingy. Rod Laver Arena is bombastic and pompous. Um, Higher Sense Arena slash Melbourne Arena slash John Kane Arena is also pretty... Eh. So we decided to try and make a building that was public but quiet. So our new Kia Arena opened for the tennis this year. But I think the most important thing was, and I'll admit openly, it's still under debate, um, the stakeholder group, including the ex-CEO who left after 12 years, very, very you know, influential person, was adamant there are no gates it's a public building. If you want to walk down there at lunchtime and sit in the stands and eat your sandwich and go with your dog, you should be able to. And we were absolutely supportive of that, including the state government architect. Um, so it was really a case of a very small detail in this case, but ideologically, it's a public building. You should be able to, the public should be able to walk in there and have, if they just want to sit there and have their sandwich, I'll admit that's under discussion at the moment. So it's always a bit of a debate. Beauty. Tricky question, I might go there. The future. Well, we're currently working on a number of projects. We're doing the redevelopment of the Arts Centre Melbourne, uh, and we'll be certainly meeting the new NGVC architects. Now they're public soon. Uh, we're doing the redevelopment of the Queen Victoria Market. We're doing a number of mental health hospital projects at the moment. Uh, and out at Northern Hospital as well. So we are engaged in a whole range of public buildings, but the theme that I've talked about tonight is consistent with all of them. No matter whether you're talking hospitals, art centres, sports centres, it's very consistent. So I'll finish with what I would call a cautionary tale. So I've chosen one project to try and illustrate all of those themes in the life of the practising architect. So I, I'll admit, I always consider myself a practising architect. I'm you know, I do the theory, I do the PhD, I do that, but in the end, my experience in speaking, not lecturing, but talking, is about practising architecture. So here's a cautionary tale, both optimistic, I wouldn't say cynical, but optimistic and pessimistic in equal measure. Uh, this project was the uh, second stage of the Melbourne Convention Centre we did a couple of years ago. Uh, finished, uh, actually finished in the... Uh, pre-pre-lockdown one COVID, so, you know, you've got a, it's like a Netflix series, you know, lockdown one, lockdown four, hopefully there's no further series in lockdown. Uh, so this was our latest project down there. Um, and as you can see, um, I thought I brought it. We'll get to it. Uh, it's, a, it's a very gold building. Um, and trying to get the state government, in this case, it was a private-public partnership, so it was a combination between private equity and public money, uh, to try and convince someone to build a gold building is a little bit tricky. Um, I consider myself quite capable at convincing people, but to get the state government to agree to a gold, a fully gold building and a gold hotel, yeah, I was going to push the limits of that. Um, to prove that architects still go on site, I'm on the gold roof of 13,000 square metres of gold roof. 
Um, it's bloody hot that day when the reflection off the gold <laughs> pretty hot. Uh, so yes, engagement with that is important. So how did we, I wouldn't say convince, but what was the narrative in the publicness that made people interested in that? Well, two. One is uh, the golden wattle. Uh, it was an incredibly significant flower for the indigenous people who lived on the river in that particular location on the Yarra. So the golden wattle was considered very, very significant to their cultural background. And then on the other side, the modern Melbourne was built, literally built, by gold. The great gold strike in Ballarat in 1851 built our city. It was the economic driver. So between those two being both a First Nations indigenous and the thing that actually literally built our city, we thought, well, gold does have uh, some resonance in that conversation. Um, it does also, going back, it does also help that in presenting this to the government, the recently appointed head of the trust was John Brumby, an ex-minister, ex-premier of Victoria, uh, and I did a bit of research on that, and in fact, he was, during his time as premier, he was the member for Ballarat. So once I mentioned the gold, he was in, and once an ex-premier is in, everyone else was in. And it's now, it's rippled through the whole building, external and interiors, the whole thing. You can see it in the, in the soffit, the ceiling, the carpet, everything. But there is a little bit of a trick in getting this work done. So that's the optimism. We actually got the gold. Most people thought we wouldn't get the gold. Um, but we found ourselves in the pre-pre-pre-COVID time, in the global politics of all the glass that was coming was coming from China. Uh, in the early days of the pandemic, there was a concern that the logistics flow of getting glass from China might be interrupted. So the builder then looked for separate sources to go, which, which of the two costs are going to be. So we got embroiled in a logistics conversation as to where the glass should come from. Um, so this is actually in China, as you can tell on the bottom slide. Um, and we sent teams up there to inspect the glass. At a personal level, it was quite tricky because it was one of those times in Beijing where the smog and the fog was health-related. It was not healthy for people. Um, so that mask is not to do with COVID. That mask is to, st is to stay alive from the smog. So, you know, these are the stories of public architecture. Once you get into the big scale, it all gets intertwined. Uh, and in fact, the glass that did come down from China for the facade was excellent. So I'm not going to... Optimism. It was excellent. We were looking for the... Mm, it's not quite right, but we inspected it in China. We inspected it on site. And it was absolutely, honestly, first class. Very happy. And so all the glass you see on the facade down there, uh, the gold zinc comes from France, uh, Spain, so Spain, and the glass comes from China. Um, everything in our public buildings comes from somewhere else. We just assemble it here. Um, First class, so, you know, totally optimistic, very happy. Carpets, a different conversation. Um, I think it's fair to say, I know Astrid and the team uh, have a history of carpets. We've tried to get carpets through every project. We've tried the, uh, the floral emblem of Victoria is the pink heath. So we've tried the pink, given its connection to the emblem of Victoria. But in the end, the operations people, uh, and is referred to in our studio as Brendan. Uh, no, so Brendan just wants grey. So in the end, we had that many examples of grey to choose from, and he chose, it's hard to say, I don't know where this works, because that, can we say that? He chose that one, the darkest, plainest grey, because Brendan has to clean the carpets every three years and replace it every six years, and contracts and contracts, so that's, that's where I launch into my professional practice conversation. But yeah, bloody carpets. We've not yet, well, we have got a pink carpet done. We did it in our own office. And we did manage to get the gold into the, um, into the convention centre. Uh, and to their credit, they picked it up. So the cafe is called the Goldfields Cafe. And they did pick up the thematic on that. And so it's individually purpose-designed carpet for them. And in fact, it is the logo for the Melbourne Convention Centre. So if someone wants to spend hours rearranging the tiles, it will actually say MCEC. Um, that would send you insane. But the final cautionary tale is 
this space, which is the main atrium space. And if you look up, you'll see the beautiful glass atrium ceiling, which we spent, I don't want to even commit how many hours we spent on the steel work, on the glass, on everything. It was a labour of love from our entire team. And for that, I am eternally grateful. But interestingly, the triangular sections of the glass, we had to get a frit to go in, a ceramic frit in the interlayer of the glass to try and reduce the heat load and the daylight. We had a graphic designer do full blow-ups there in the office. We literally went and did everything as forensically detailed as possible. And so these were the drawings that we sent to China. Uh, and I'm sure most of you being architects would know uh, that you know, going back a long time, you draw the dots in the corner because in the old days for hand drawings, you couldn't draw dots across the entire piece of glass or you'd be there for three weeks. Then we went to first level of computers. You know, the ink cartridge would run out with the amount of dots. So the convention of just drawing a little bit and saying, you know, it's across the whole thing is the convention of what architects traditionally, it's a convention that is, we thought, internationally global. You've got the cross section showing the, where the, the ceramic dot goes. We've got the size, the profile. We've given everything to the glass consultants in China. And they decided to just do the drawing. <laughs> so they literally made that. So that's where public architecture, you have to go the metrics of the fire. You know, the Norwegians go high, low, die, death, death, death. We just accept that as being what we understand. We thought globally that's what architects understood. You draw a little bit and the rest is the same. I got the call from our project actor. I think Adrian's here. Adrian's at the back. Uh, Christmas holidays, I think it was, just after Christmas. We were already three months late on the project and it arrived on the dock. They opened it and it was like, holy shit, holy shit. They've actually made the dots, literally. And we're talking about a, a contract of, you know, millions of dollars. So in the high-tech world of thing, sending things to China, getting it delivered to Australia, the uh, managing contractor decided to send it up to a warehouse in Thornbury, Epping, somewhere up north, uh, and have a bunch of guys for about three days literally grind. Well, the other mistake the, the supplier made was the frit was supposed to be in the interlayer between the glass, but they got that wrong as well. They just put it on the one side. So in fact, it wasn't correct to spec for one reason, but also it wasn't in the interlayer, it was on the outside. So I went up to Thornbury, and these guys spent three or four days literally grinding it off. There they are. So the confluence, I guess I use this as a cautionary tale, because you get the confluence between uber high-tech, digital, global, glass from somewhere comes here, and you end up in a factory in Epping with guys just grinding it off. So they ground it off, and then they stuck on uh, a, a film. They just stuck on plastic stuff on the inside. And you can still see, if you want to be observant, you can still see the crap job. And we're talking about... So that's where public architecture, I find, is that interesting confluence between the two different things. So look, I'll, I'll finish on nearly that, the last three slides. I would like to acknowledge people. teams, detail, to make public buildings, there is a lot of detail. So this is the final inspection for the convention centre, and you can see it's reported that every architrave, every shadow line is recorded for compliance or non-compliance. Everything goes to that level of detail. And for a building of, you know, $400 million and 27,000 square metres, to get to that detail on everything does require an obsessiveness. So I think our team is out here. NHs? Woo! Uh, it does require people. Public architecture does require... There's lots of networks, lots of systems, and lots of stuff. But in the end, it does require people. Uh, and if you want to be engaged in public architecture, it, it is... It is a long journey. So these projects take from start to finish. Well, on the Art Centre project, we're 
five years down line and the program is set for another 10 years. So that's a 15 year program. And we've been at Melbourne Park now for 10 years. So if you want to get something done quickly, not the cup of tea for that. It's a, it's a slow process, but it does require people to do that. Um, and that is a great journey to go on. Epilogue. I thought I had it, but I've lost it. People ask me where the gold comes from. It comes from there. I was a child of the, uh, the space age. And I thought I brought a bit of gold with me, but I have lost it. So yes, uh, the gold is part of our work. Um, and yes, I was a child of this era. And for those who don't know, this was the lunar module, the LEM, that got people onto the moon and off again. Uh, and the gold is part of the requirements for that. So people always ask, where does it come from? It comes from there. So look, thank you very much. I believe the rain is coming, so we probably need to finish. So thank you very much.